knowledge in DNS. It's relatively the same, same thing. We have a part where we sign something, we provide information. So that's where we cut our rows. And then we have a totally separate process. That's the validation, where we, where we verify what others have put into the system in terms of ROAS. And you see there's a very clear division between the two parts because you could be signing your ROAS without validating. They're two totally separate uh, parts and vice versa. You could be validating without having signed your, uh, your ROAS for reasons we don't know. I see a question in the chat. One second. Is the root certificate created and self-signed by the five RIRs or is the root certificate created by IANA? Ah, this is a very good question. So the five, um, the five RIRs have different uh, certificates. No, there isn't one created by IANA. Uh, IANA is out of the equation here. I'm not sure this is a very good statement to say, but in the sense like IANA doesn't, didn't do anything at the moment so far. But uh, we'll see when we talk about the, the, the validation, I'll show you that there is a, what's called a trust anchor locator. So there's a file for each one of the regional registries that includes a pointer to where the, uh, all the rows, all the certificates can, all the keys can be found. Well, public keys, not the private ones. And, uh, and there's also a, uh, the, 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 the public key for the top. And those are distributed as files with all the um, validators, with all the software. There's a small exception, but I'll talk about it later. Let's not get into that now. I hope I answered your question, uh, Sergio. Sergio. Okay, perfect. But there will be more. Let's not step ahead of, of where we are. Let's look at let's look at rows, and then I'll get back to you as well when we when we talk instead about the uh, validation. So we have two separate processes. We have signature and validation. Let's start looking at the signature because that's the that's the easiest way. That's the easiest part. Um, basically, we have a row. That stands for, uh, oh, I, I always get confused, but it's written later, route origin authorization. Let's go back here. It's a statement. It's a piece of, it's a file that contains basically the prefix and the origin, similar to a route object. It's the same exact type of information. And it gives us which ASN is authorized to announce a certain prefix. But a ROA is a bit uh, enhanced from a route object. Um, well, route objects can, can exist in multiple types for the same prefix with different origin. And there's a, there's a keyword that we're introducing here, max length. We'll see that in a moment. And ROAs can overlap. So you can create ROAs the way you want. You can have multiple ROAs for the same prefix with different uh, origin, you can have uh, multiple ROAs with different max length, they can overlap, you can have a row for a slash 22 for uh, one of the slash 23s covered by this slash 22 and so on. So you have complete freedom on how you can create a row. And what does it contain? It contains a prefix we've already mentioned, an origin ASN. So far, this is exactly the same as a root object. But while they were creating RPKI, they decided to add something that could help you if you have a large network, if you have the need to make different types of announcements. So the maximum length, max length. Um, normally you would have a prefix which contains the in slash notation, the, the prefix itself, and then you have the max length that express from where to where basically. It can go. But let's look at an example to show you what max length is. Let's assume we have a network that has max length slash 24. So we have the slash 22 max length slash 24. 
It means that in this case, we could announce the slash 22, we could announce the separate slash 23s, and also the, all the separate slash 24s, all contained under this slash 22. If we go something more specific, <coughs> forget the fact that the slash 25 would be filtered in other ways. But the slash 25s in this case, they would not be covered by this row. They would come up as, we'll see that later, as invalid. But so far, you just have to know the ROA wouldn't cover them. So another example, we have this uh, slash 21 with AS2121 uh, as origin and max length is slash 21. So basically, this covers just the slash 21 and nothing more specific. So everything, oops, let me do. Okay, this, I, I pushed too many times the, the keyboard. So we have the slash 21 and anything more specific from slash 22 is below, not covered. So, well, covered, but max length doesn't allow for them. So if you see such an announcement, you should be in theory filtering it out. But then if, let's say one day you want to change your behavior and you want to announce uh, something different. You can create a more specific ROA for this specific slash 23 saying max length up to slash 24. So you would change the status to make it like this. Same thing you can do it with another part of the address space. You have a slash 23, AS2121, max length slash 23. So you go and change the status of just one of these BGP announcements. So far, so good. I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, feel free to also, now that we almost just started, um, raise your hand, uh, ask the question via voice or anything. I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any question you can come up with related to RPKI. But with such a flexibility in uh, max length, we have, oh, here a question before I start the slide. Is there a best practice? Ah, here we go. This is, this is a good question. Is there a best practice or guideline document on how to create ROAs with prefixes? Okay, um, this slide and the next one is going to show you what a drawback could be from using uh, max length. And then I'll, at the end of these two slides, I will, I will give you a short guideline um, because there is a draft RFC that explains this and gives uh, also short uh, suggestions on how to create your, your, your ROAS. So stay with me for a moment for the next two slides and I will answer your question. So you created a single ROA authorizing the entire slash 22 with a max length of slash 24. So, Imagine you have this slash 23, perfectly acceptable. You have someone though, one day, you're only announcing the slash 23. You have someone one day that decides they want to mess up with your network. It's a relatively simple procedure. Imagine this someone runs a data center or has access to, to a BGP uh, speaker could take your ASN, add your ASN to, to their AS set, basically claiming that you are a customer behind them, wait a few days, and then set up a BGP router behind, your, behind their router that uses your ASN and announces that specific slash 24. At this point, you would have someone announcing maliciously a slash 24 with your, your ASN as origin. Behind their ASN, so the filters, because they added you to their ASN, uh, AS set, the filters have been cleared, everything's fine. Basically, that would show up as valid. That's slash 24. That's a malicious announcement, which RPKI cannot distinguish from another one in this sense, because RPKI only looks at the origin and it doesn't look at the AS path. There are technologies to 
check the ace path there. Not really there yet uh, in different ways. But so, so far, let's focus on this. The origination shows up as correct. Your ASN is announcing that slash 24. RPKI cannot do anything. So here's a suggestion. Create ROAS for your BGP announcements only. Could consider them the same way you would consider route objects because the same trick works with route objects. If you create too many route objects that are, uh, that are too open, you are going to have the same exact issue. In this case, slash 22 with a max length of slash 23, if you have the same malicious attacker that tries to run a, the same kind of attack, that will show up as invalid because the ROA only covers up to slash 23. Now, there is a there are some, some considerations to make here. Um, so the main suggestion is to follow what you have in the root objects. Follow what you have now in your specific BGP announcements. Don't be too, uh, don't allow too much. This comes at the cost of flexibility. The moment you want to allow a new network to be announced, BGPs, uh, the BGP, sorry, RPKI is not as immediate as route objects. Route objects, you would go on the database, you would create a new route object, it would show up immediately or well, with a delay of uh, maybe 15, 20 seconds, depending on the synchronization of the different servers. With RPKI, you create a ROA, and it might take some time before it shows up. Say 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, there is a, um, I haven't checked if a colleague is on the tutorial. If Amrish is on the tutorial, maybe he could say something more about that. But um, they, we, oh yes, I'm really sure here. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you've, you've run a study together yes. with other people. Yes. And what was the result? What's the average time it takes for a ROA to show up once it was created? Yeah, uh, so it depends on the action. So whether it is a creation, so hi, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Amrish, I'm a colleague of Max. We do a few things together. Um, yeah, so we did a study recently on how much time it takes when you create a ROA and at what point in time uh, the, you see the change in BGP. And uh, it what we saw is it depends on whether it is a creation or, or, or a deletion of a ROA. And uh, creation, it would take, uh, it can take as, as, uh, as low as 10 minutes um, because in some in some uh, RIOs, for example, Epinic, they do have like a batch processing that they do every every 10 minutes. So um, it can take 10 minutes plus a few minutes for it to appear on the BGP. That's the best case. But but it also depending on uh, the the ISP, the type of um, the router they are they are using. Um, so the default settings that they have. And on top of that, you also have uh, the cache validator, which also has a, a, a refresh time. Um, so it, it can take up, up to one hour uh, in some cases to for, for, the, yeah. for the change to appear in BGP. So well, imagine you are in a hurry, yeah. but then it's, uh, it, ha it takes an hour for the world to show up. Mm. Yeah. This can this can sometimes be, be a problem. Let's say you're facing a DDoS, you want to create ROAS uh, speedily, and then yeah, you have to wait an hour. So yeah. On yeah. on the so, revocation side, um, if I may, um, Max. Oh, go uh, ahead. Sorry, sorry. It, it might it might take a, sometimes more time. This is what we have observed, because what we are suspecting is that in some cases. Uh, some some BGP speakers they would be connected to not only one uh, cache validator they might be connected to a few cache validators because the sometimes you have this kind of setup for redundancy and depending on the state of the cache validator some might some might be up to date but some might have a refresh time which is uh, much bigger and then so they refresh at a at a later time 
So the 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 validity of the ROA will take the one the one it has uh, the one the, the positive response it is getting from any of those validators. Um, so even if on one it is up to G, it will take the one. It will always take the one which is um, positive on 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 one of the validators. So this can take a bit of time, and th therefore we, what we have seen generally is revocation takes much longer than than creation of error. Thank you, Mrish. So stay online if I if I have any other questions about about this timing. But so as you've as you've seen, thank you. <laughs> as you've seen, um, the suggestion is to be strict, but uh, consider also the option of preparing yourself in case you 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 want to announce something more specific or. Uh, you want to change something in your announcements. Don't forget, especially when you want to change or move or do something that ROAS can overlap. And so you can have ROAS with different origins. Um, you can prepare for a migration time in advance. Um, so you have great flex flexibility, but you also have to keep in mind uh, with flexibility, some drawbacks might appear. And one of them is the one that we showed you here. There is a draft discussing this issue. Um, I will look it up while, uh, while Turn speaks later. So the ROA is an object that contains this data and gets signed as well by the uh, members, by the LIR. So then it becomes part of the full chain of trust. So we can start from the row, look, uh, figure out who signed it, check the signature, verify the, the, the CA from the member, and then verify that it was signed and that there's no revocation uh, from the top, from the uh, regional registry. So, um, Patrick, have we answered your question? I know this is not a full set of best practices, but there isn't that much else we can say. So, the rule, the general rule, is to follow, try to follow route objects, or uh, try to make the best compromise between being strict and uh, have enough flexibility so that when you know you will need to change things, you have it and you have it immediately. Or live with the fact that when you make a change in ROAS, it might take up to an hour for it to propagate. So this is the most I can I can say, at least that I've seen around, but uh, I see Turn is uh, nodding. I I think that's the most we can, we can tell you at the moment. Yeah, okay. So uh, I mentioned that one of the uh, plus, pluses of running RPKI is that differently from the uh, IRR, the Internet Routing Registry, or not differently, there was a different start. There was a way at the point when RPKI was uh, developed as a concept to say, well, we want everyone, we want all the uh, regional registries to be on board and, to, and we want to follow the hierarchy. So we have the, the anchors that are at the registries, and then we have members who depend directly from there. Okay, so uh, the answer from Patrick is be strict or follow the route objects is a good guideline, thank you. With the ability to create a slash 16 up to slash 24 versus exactly what you announce and no guidelines, this was why I was wondering. Okay, good. Uh, and then turn replying, uh, what we typically do is create ROAS only for the exact prefix and for the slash 24. So we can reroute a slash 24 via the DDoS uh, scrubbing network. That's also a good suggestion because there have been different discussions about what to do in case of DDoS because you want the, the scrubbing system to start uh, working very soon. But then if you have to wait for the propagation of, uh, of route objects, uh, sorry, of um, ROAS, it might take a long time. So what you want to do is uh, maybe uh, follow Turn's suggestion to 
also create the entries for slash 24s. But then <clears throat> I'll show you there's a tool you can use to figure out if someone else's string is announcing your prefixes. And we'll see it at the end. And I haven't, I don't think I've seen the author on the call today. No, not yet. So we follow, we go back to the RPKI certificate structure. We follow the, <coughs> the hierarchy of allocation. And we have uh, similar to what we've seen in the previous slide with the, with the um, uh, chain of trust here, we have the IRR, we have the member, we have the row. Same exact one, very simple. And then we have either hosted or delegated RPKI. And this is a long-standing discussion. People who love uh, delegated, people who love hosted, uh, there's no one size fits all. And, uh, and it's up to you to decide which one you prefer. But what does it mean? What, what does it mean when we say hosted or delegated? When we say hosted, it means that the Ripen CC or, well, this is the example I have here, uh, but the Ripen CC or Arin, Apenic, your uh, local regional registry runs everything for you. So in the case of Ripen CC, we'll, uh, we'll see that the, there's a web interface. Uh, the Ripen CC creates the CA for you. You just have to push a button. And then there's a very easy to use uh, interface to create and delete rows, to change them, do everything you need. But this is easy when you uh, have a very small number of, uh, of networks in just one regional registry, like my case. I have my own ASN, but I have three networks. I have two IPv6 and one IPv4. So in my case, which is very, very simple, hosted works perfectly because then I don't have to deal with, uh, with anything. Uh, I just go create, push a button, RepNCC does everything for me behind the curtain and does the key rollovers, the signing is automated, everything's fine. So I, I just have to uh, focus on creating and publishing my roles. <clears throat> okay, so there's a, there's a suggestion from Mohammed going back to one slide. In that scenario, would autonomous object help us in specifying the import and export policy? Um, it would, it would help, but unfortunately not many tools or not many networks look at the policies in the autonomous object. So, you, I always I always suggest people to keep them updated when possible, but at the same time consider that there's a very very low number of networks actually looking at those uh, at that data. So um, if you can keep them updated, but don't, I wouldn't trust the fact that uh, other people will look at them. So route objects, ninety nine point nine percent, you can say they will trust the route objects. ROAs, 99.9%. Uh, .9%. I always keep that 0.1% because you never know. Um, but I would say you have very, very good um, um, chances that route objects will be looked at, will be considered. Same for ROAs. But when, when it's about uh, import and export policies in, uh, in autonomous objects, I wouldn't really trust that, unfortunately. So go, getting back to, to our hosted RPKI, very simple, especially at RIPE. I go and create my ROAs, go and push a button. The CA gets created for me. No key rollovers to take care of. Everything's done by the original registry. Same situation you have uh, on the other RIRs with different levels of uh, automation or simplicity. In Arin, you have to uh, generate your keys yourself and then upload them. Um, I'm not sure about Afrinic, but uh, in basically most of the cases, you, you have a simple life. So there's not that much you, you, you need to do. But if your use case is a bit more complex, let's say you have <clears throat> uh, resources, so networks from uh, two, three, 
uh, different RIRs, and uh, you don't want to go in and change things manually on all of them. You could run delegated RPKI, uh, where you run your own software, where you you have you run your own CA. You set up, of course, a here we say a connection with the CA from your original registry, where they sign your uh, local. Uh, the top of your local CA. So you create a uh, relationship between the two. And then you create your own objects. Then there's, a there's another issue. You have to publish these objects. So um, <clears throat> there are uh, different solutions. One is to run your own uh, rsync server, run your own um, RDAP so software. RDAP basically is a is a protocol that uses HTTP, HTTPS as a base and distributes raw as using HTTPS, basically. Or uh, some RIRs, uh, now Arin, I know Rapinsys is working on it. You can take, so you have your own software running on your own hardware, you generate your ROAs, you sign them, and then you're given a way to publish those ROAs at your parent, so at your uh, RIR, so that there are no, not so many distributed endpoints to look at in the world. Because whenever you will see your validator runs, it has to download all the ROAs from all the publication points in the world. If we restrict the number of these publication points, it should be better for everyone. So uh, we don't end up with 70,000 different uh, HTTPS hosts we have to contact every time we want to update our raw repository. That would still work, but maybe not recommended. But if you have some, uh, personally, I would suggest if you have a very special use case, run delegated RPKI. Otherwise, <clears throat> if you don't do much with your ROAs, you don't change your route objects already every week or so, I would suggest go with hosted, with a hosted solution because that's the best one. At RIPE, you can also certify PI resources, but there's a specific uh, procedure you have to follow, but you can do that. But then that's very specific for the RIPE region. I left it there because it shows that there is, they have thought about everything. And then here we have a demo on creating uh, ROAs. So let me stop sharing the slides. I'll share my screen from the LAR portal. Here we go. So here I am, LAR portal. Um, let me make the text a bit bigger so you can see the 100%. Here we go. I will sign in with Ripe and CC Access. And of course, uh, there's a disclaimer. I can show you. How things are in RIPE, um, in Afrinic, in Apinic, in other registries, things are a bit different, but I don't have access to all of them. Uh, I have my own LIR in RIPE, and this is what I can show you. So I've logged into the LIR portal. I go into my RPKI dashboard, and what I'm greeted with is I have two BGP announcements that are seen. I told you I have three networks, but we'll get to that in a moment. And then it says there's an origin ASN. Let me make the text a bit bigger because I think, okay. You see that I have an ASN that's originating them. There's a prefix, a slash 29 and the slash 22 IPv4. And these are current status valid. So I can go and check what ROAs do I have? I actually have more than those. I have an additional ROA for this 2A0F column FD00 slash 29, but there is no affected announcement here. So this is a, um, a way where I can show you how helpful the uh, interface here is. It shows me that I have a row, but it doesn't affect any BGP announcement because I'm not announcing the slash 29 IPv6 yet. And then there is a row as another example where I uh, put, actually, let me delete it. 
Okay, I want to delete it. I check and review the changes. There's no affected announcement. I can say, go and apply the change. Voila, so the row is gone. And let me show you how I create a new one. AS number 14.13.84. This is the uh, ISOC. Uh, we have a small network we run at ISOC just for a bit of research. I can pick one prefix from the ones I have. A slash 24, and here I supply, I will need to close the windows in a moment. I can say, let's go up to slash 27, max length, because just because I can. Here we are, the system tells me this is a new one. It's It got staged, so I could create it for now. I can apply the change or discard it. I can go ahead and just apply them. And here we are, my ROA has been created. That's really easy. And also as easy would be to revoke the hosted CA. One day I want to change and run my own Krill instance, run my own uh, Dragon Research RPKI.net uh, system. I could just revoke my hosted CA and start again from scratch. And, uh, and go through the procedure to create my own CA. Oh, and as you can see, I created the ROA in 30 seconds and consider what we have here. We have a ROA for this slash 22. Later on during the exercises, we'll actually use this ROA to, uh, to do origin validation. So far, so good. Uh, I'll stop sharing so I can have a look maybe at the questions. We don't have any other question. Oh, we have. If you make an entry for a slash 16 with max length of slash 24, so there would be one row up. If you make an entry for the same prefix but covering, uh, well, that would be, yes, that's correct. Although it wouldn't be the same prefix, but it would be each one of the slash 24s under that slash 16. It would be exactly the same in the end. If you have, um, if you have a, uh, if you create a ROA that says 16 max length 24, but then you create all the more specific slash 24s, you're just, you're not adding anything because they would be already valid. You would you would just end up with uh, with plenty of uh, with two hundred and fifty six um, uh, other objects. It's it would be pretty much the same, although with the with the max length you would cover anything in between. So uh, slash eighteen, slash nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two. So uh, in this case, it's up to you and how you want to prepare your uh, your ROAs for your uh, coming BGP announcements. Does it make sense? Okay, perfect, thanks. Okay, so I stopped sharing and now I'll hand it over to Tun because we have created the ROAs and we have ROAs. And then if you, uh, if you want to check what you have done and when it shows up in the, in the world when it becomes visible, you can use a tool that Turn will show you in a moment. Yeah, right. So hi everyone. Uh, let me start sharing my screen then. Uh, let's see. This should be visible for you right now, I hope. Yes, it is, perfect. Okay, great. So um, I think I will skip through a few of my slides because Max already told you some things about them, but here we go. Right, so uh, short thing about NLNOC, we're the Dutch Network Operator Group. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year, which will be uh, with a, a live event on uh, September the 30th um, in Amsterdam. We're totally community driven um, and we do a lot of cool stuff like the NLNOC ring, we have Looking Glass, we have IRR Explorer, which I'm presenting about right now. Um, and well, the uh, event I told you about the uh, yearly NLO day. So I'm Don Vink. I'm uh, one of the NLO board members in my day job. I'm a 
the senior network engineer or the tech team lead for a bit, a reasonably small Dutch ISP and data center. Uh, I have implemented RPKI validation in my network. I crashed RPDs, uh, triggered some funky Junos bug, which caused uh, our routers to crash. But uh, we're all good now after some upgrades. So, um, right. So this is basically what Max already told you. We need to filter routes. RPKI is helpful, but it's not everything. You only have origin validation. You don't have path validation, for example, and also. Um, not everyone is using it yet. And route objects in the IRR database help, but as Max explained, there are many IRR databases. There are conflicting information, and some databases are very complex to get data removed from. So, yeah, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, and how do you deal with the fact that you have all this information and you have no idea where to look? And uh, now that's where IRR Explorer comes in. Um, IR Explorer is both a web page and a, a tool which you can host yourself. I wouldn't really recommend it, but you can do it, um, which shows for a prefix or a number of prefixes um, an overview of all the IRR database registrations, of the RPKI ROAS, of all routing table entries we can find. And we try to, well, present it in a useful format so you have. Um, uh, suggestions on how you can improve these uh, either ROAS or uh, route objects or you know, whatever it runs into. And it um, points out complex. And this helps you reach two things, better reachability of prefixes, because you can well, find out that there is uh, a ROA missing, which prevents others from accepting your prefix per probably. Um, it helps clean up the IRR databases because it will show you that there can be a lot of mess there. Um, and in this presentation, I will be mostly showing you some output of the IRR Explorer um, tool. So you can find IRR Explorer at irrexplorer.nlog.net. Um, and this is basically the main page. It's not much, it's just a form with one field and you can fill in either a prefix, an AS number or an AS set name. Um, and for each of the three, it basically does the same. It goes and look up all this information and show you what it can find about it. Um, in my examples, I only use uh, specific prefixes to keep it, well, simple and condensed. Um, for ASNs and AS sets, it basically works the same. It's just more prefixes at the same time. Well, let's... Um, Take a look what happens if you uh, enter a prefix in uh, IR Explorer. I picked uh, the uh, RIPRIS routing beacon, uh, which is a known good prefix, uh, which has a valid row up. Um, and here, you, well, this is what you see when you just push, enter the prefix and push submit. Um, you see a table showing you uh, a report for the, uh, this specific prefix. And well, the, the green shows uh, uh, clearly everything is good. Um, we see, and I'll, I'll show the columns in detail in the next slide, uh, a number of things about this prefix. Um, it combines the rear data, who is assigning or allocating IP space. It uh, shows what's happening in BGP, in RPKI, and what is in the various IR databases. So if you look at that, uh, the columns of the table, you see, in, well, just as I explained, the prefix is found in one of the sources. Um, in later uh, examples, you will see that for one prefix, you can see more than one output. Uh, so you see more than one uh, uh, rows of uh, data. Um, and this shows in a pretty condensed way everything we can find. The right column. In this case, shows that um, this specific prefix is found in the right database. If the, there is a route object in another database, for example, in LDB or uh, RADB, you see more than one column, one for each uh, individual uh, IRR. A um, few hints on the output. 
well, you can expand the help text at the top of the screen and they, they explain in more detail what um, the results you can see mean. So what does a specific error message or warning mean? Um, well, the row colors are obviously significant. Now we saw only green in later examples, you will see yellow and red, for example, to um, show well, possible issues or plain errors. Many of the output items are clickable and you can see either who is information or uh, uh, database information or uh, routing table info. So you can see um, what exactly IRR Explorer found about a specific prefix. In some cases, you see icons next to an AS number um, and they have a meaning. The check mark means something is okay. The cross means it's not. And if you hover over it, you'll see more info. And we've now seen only uh, HTML output, a nicely re rendered web table. Um, there's a link for the JSON output as well. So if you want to, you can yeah, use that and well, process it in any way you like. So, now look and, and another uh, prefix. This is also from Route RIS. This is a, a known bad routing beacon. And you, know, you obviously see the red colors here. Um, there are two issues, and you see two pieces of advice there. Um, the first issue is that RPKI origin does not match the BGP origin. Well, as Max explained, you can create a ROBA. In this case, the ROBA tells us that AS196615 can announce this specific prefix. But the BGP table shows us that AS12654 is announcing it. Uh, that doesn't match. And um, of course, you would expect either uh, a, a ROA to be available for uh, 12654, or you would expect a route in the, the routing tables for the 196615 ASN. Um, and the second issue is that there are RPK invalid routes found. The route object in RIPE has an RPK invalid. Uh, origin ASN. So the right column shows us that there is a, a, a route object for 126454, sorry. Um, while RPKI tells us it should be 196615. And only one of those two can be correct. You can't, because if you would um, start, well, it, 12654 cannot advertise this prefix as it is because RPKI tells us it's not correct. So there should be a route object for 196615. Or once again, uh, you, you could delete the row for 196615. As you see, there are there is not one way you can solve this. And the way to solve it is mostly up to you because you should know uh, the way your network is behaving. This is not something uh, IRR Explorer can tell you, but it can point out there's a conflict here. These two things do not match how to solve it, that should be up to you. Um, up to now, we only saw one uh, output column or table, and it's the exact prefix matches. Um, sometimes it's possible that there are routes or objects found, prefixes found in one of the databases, routing tables or the ROAS that cover uh, more than just that one uh, prefix you asked about. And in that case, we IRR Explorer will not just show you the exact match for what you asked, but also for the least specific match of what it found, uh, everything it can uh, tell you about that as well. Um, so that can be helpful if you want to look at a, the broader scope of what, what's happening with a, a prefix. Um, if you look at what we're seeing here, you see that um, this is the, one of the Cloudflare prefixes, it seems. Um, and there, for the 20, slash 20, there is a good ROA. Uh, everything is fine. For the slash 12, they don't seem to have created a ROA. But in the second table, you see that they did create ROAs for every slash 20. So you could wonder why is that uh, slash 12 in BGP without uh, 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 a ROA. Cloudflare may have good reasons for them. I, 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 I can't tell. 
Well, let's look at some more errors that we can find. Um, I was curious about the one dot one dot one that's uh, one actually the 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 the, the, uh, the cloudflare DNS uh, IP, and one of the fascinating things you see is that there are well a number of entries that don't match here. The first uh, uh, row or the, sorry yeah row in the, the table shows us what we would expect. Everything looks good. There's a, uh, the slash 22, uh, or sorry, the slash 24 is announced. It has an RPKI valid robot and it's registered in AP data. That's fine. But then we find two other uh, prefixes, which are slash 20, uh, 32s registered in RADV. Um, and yeah, well, they are cu curious, of course, because they are registered by two different ASNs, not Cloudflare, but I haven't written down which one it, they are, but um, that, yeah, they obviously shouldn't be here. Um, in fact, um, those route objects are RPKI invalid if you would announce it like that. Um, IRS were also spots that this um, object is in RIDV, even though you would expect an object in the APNIC database because APNIC allocated this IP space to uh, Cloudflare. Um, and the last notice, notice, which is actually a good thing in this case, is that although there are uh, this prefix uh, has route objects, these slash 32s, we don't see them in the DSZ. The, they are not actually seen in any routing tables, luckily. Of course, the good thing here would be that these slash 32s would be deleted. Um, I'm not sure if Cloudflare has attempted to get that done. Um, I also have no idea why these specific slash 32s are in the database. Um, they don't make much sense. Okay, now there are some more uh, fascinating, fascinating things to see. Um, one of the uh, prefixes I tested when looking for, well, funny things to show was uh, the Toredo prefix. Toredo used to be the IPv6 tunnel broker for people who didn't have uh, uh, native IPv6. And um, Toredo was um, any casted by a lot of different uh, ASNs. So you could host your own Toredo server, register a route object, so uh, you could start advertising the Toredo IPv6 space, and you were all good to go. Um, you see a number of things here. For example, you see that there are a lot of route objects uh, in various route databases, like altb, entity.com, and uh, the right non-authoritative database. Um, it's like 15 altogether or something, um, even though the BGP column shows us that only two networks are actively advertising this prefix. And we also see another thing, it's the, the, the red uh, error message. Um, there are no route objects that match the DSZ origin. Um, and that's for the AS6939 uh, Hurricane Electric Network. They didn't create uh, an IRR object. Um, and of course, you see here, especially that there's a lot of old uh, um, entries that should have been deleted long ago. So what can you do with IRR Explorer? Um, you can improve the writability of your prefixes. You can do that by, well, uh, checking periodically. Uh, what do you see when you enter your prefixes? Do you see any issues? Any, uh, well, especially the, the red notifications should stand out and you should probably investigate. Um, but you can do housekeeping on your IRR database entries because it can point out all uh, things that shouldn't be there, especially if you didn't create them, but someone else created objects which relate to your IP space in another database, like we saw for the 1.1.1.0/24 prefix. Um, you can help it to analyze routing problems. Um, why isn't my prefix advertised uh, to some specific other network, or uh, why can't I? see a better route towards that network. It could be that RPKI is uh, one of the, uh, is, is causing one of the problems there. And 
getting the information there really helps. Um, this is the one I use it mostly for. If a customer comes to me and says, hey, would you uh, start advertising my IP space? Um, and please transfer it to your network or to your ASN. Um, IRR Explorer really helps you to check, are there any RPKI uh, entries I need to get rid of or should I add them? Um, are there route objects which can be uh, a problem? Can I, uh, is there prefix advertised at this moment? Um, all these things is IRR Explorer able to tell you. And of course, monitoring your prefixes, just checking uh, if everything is still okay, if, or if you need to do any changes, especially the JSON output helps here if you can automate it in any way. One very important thing to keep in mind is that IR Explorer is an opinion on the information we can find. Um, it's based on best current practices for routing, but it can be very well that you have a good reason to do something that IRR Explorer um, well, claims is incorrect or um, uh, shows a warning. It is not the absolute truth. It's just an opinion. And I think we were right in many times, but there may be reasons you do things differently. So, um, I read Explorer was developed and maintained, uh, and it was mostly by um, uh, help with uh, from the uh, Rive NCC Community Fund and uh, ISOC, and we really like to thank them for that because uh, without that, it wouldn't be possible to maintain uh, this tool. So if you have any questions on IRR Explorer, if you'd like to check the source code or you open a, an issue, feel free to contact us by mail or uh, open an issue on the issue tracker if you have a suggestion how to improve it or if you see something wrong, which can of course also happen, um, please contact us. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I haven't seen any questions so far. Okay. Hmm. I think maybe the questions will come later. Who knows? Or, or who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's well, a lot for the take. moment. Yes, it's. Uh, I, I understand it might be a lot to take in. Yeah. But uh, thank you, Tone. I will. Uh, I will uh, go back to to the presentation, and then if you. If any of you have any question, any remaining question about uh, uh, IRR Explorer, feel free to, to put it in the chat and then uh, I can answer. I don't know if Turn has time to stay with us uh, also uh, now that, that you've finished presenting, but feel free to ask any questions here and I'll, we'll do the best to answer them. I'll try to stay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Okay, let me get back to, to the presentation now because we, we basically now look at the same type of, uh, sort of the same type of data that we can see. Well, it's, it is the same data we see in, in IRR Explorer, but let's say we, we have software that is supposed to be uh, doing that work for us. So we look at the other side of RPKI from the signature from generating data, we move over to verifying how this data is. And when we look at this, we, we encounter software that are called RIP, uh, RPKI validators. These are software that create a, what's called a local validated cache with all the valid rows, which at that point change name and they become VRPs, but I still like to call them ROAs all the way. I know Amrish doesn't like this. I know Amrish likes to be more specific, but because Amrish used to be used to work on the RPKI repository at Afrinik, uh, but let's keep calling them ROAs for the moment. Let's not make things more complicated for the moment. So <clears throat> an RPKI validator is a software that uh, well, whose goal is to download all the RPKI repositories from the RIRs, but also it takes all the pointers to all the other repositories for um, 
delegated that RPKI. So it contacts each one of them, gets all the RPKI data, so downloads it. And when we talk about RPKI data, we talk about um, ROAS, we talk about certificates, we talk about keys, public keys, of course. And it uses this data starting from the ROAS basically to validate all the chains of trust. So it does some uh, uh, sort of cryptographic work. It validates the signatures, it validates uh, the full chain, makes sure there is always a relationship that is fulfilled between every piece of data, and then creates this local validated cache. So has a local database that contains all the ROAs, the ones that have passed all these tests, and then has a component that's a server that runs a protocol called RPKI RTR, which is used to send this data to the routers. So this is basically how it works. You have the five repositories, the five, uh, the, the, the RIPNCC, ARIN, APNIC, LACNIC, and AFRINIC. And as you might notice, it's not that we forgot to add the green check on, on ARIN. The ARIN repository, uh, well, the, the TAL file, the TAL, the Trust Anchor Locator, it's a file, uh, I mentioned it already, that contains the location of the repositories of the uh, RIR and the public key. Uh, all the four you see, RIPNCC, APNIC, LACNIC, and AFNIC are distributed freely. ARIN has a special agreement with the, uh, company, the, the organizations that produce, that maintain the validators. The ARIN TAL can be distributed, but users have to acknowledge they have read the terms and conditions to use it. That's the only difference. In the past, you had to manually go and download it and put it into your validator. <clears throat> now it's easier. And I have an example uh, demo in a moment where, where I can sh I show you that there is that, uh, that small limitation. Okay, I see something in the chat. Okay, there we have a question on IRR Explorer. What does the warning message expected route object in ARIN but only found in other IRRs really means? One of my prefixes is getting this advice, but the ROA was submitted in ARIN. I think, Tim, this is for you. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, it, it, it is not about ROAs in its case. It is about uh, a route objects. Um, your IP space is assigned or allocated to you by ARIN, but the database entry is probably made in another database like uh, RIDB or route or uh, routeDB or NTTcom or you know just what you chose, um, and it just shows that there's a mismatch between the um, da the database that the, um, assigned or allocated the uh, the prefix and the one you registered it in. That's this is specifically something which I meant um, um, with the um, you can have good reasons to do otherwise. Uh, this is not per se bad. It can be uh, uh, that you had good reasons to use another database to uh, uh, put that data entry in. Um, but IRR Explorer would expect you to, that the, mo the most common thing is to register objects in the database that allocated you the resources. And that's basically what this is telling you. Is that clear in this way? So it has nothing to do with the row as you created. Yes, ah. okay. <laughs> so you're one of those people who use a third party uh, database to create exactly. route updates. There we go, yeah. that's a great example, uh, thanks. And like I said, there could be very good reasons to do so, but yeah. we can tell, we can just spot it and tell you, well, you may, may want to consider doing it in the Aaron database, but maybe not. Okay. So, <clears throat> Um, to make it clear, Renata, having the objects in RADB or ARIN doesn't make any difference when you when you intend to have your uh, your prefix routed by 
your upstreams or or uh, peers or anyone else. Uh, the the suggestion from IRR Explorer, as Tun just said, is you have a, you have a, an, an official IRR from Arin now you can use. So if possible, create the object there as well, and then you and one day you might want to to if possible delete the the RADB object or if you have a maintainer there and you pay the yearly fee for the maintainer, you could also at that point maybe. Uh, give up the maintainer, delete your objects, and then just keep the ones in uh, in Arin. Because don't forget that then the Arin object gets um, mirrored in uh, RADB as well. So you you should see that there as well. Okay, but that's that's a good thing. Thanks for the thanks for the answer, Tun. And I, I didn't spot, I have to admit, when I was reading the, the question, I also got puzzled the moment. And then I, I realized that we were talking about root object and ROAS, and it was mixed. So thank you for pointing that out. OK, so um, I was talking about trust anchor locators. The role of the validator is to be in the middle of it all, download the data, verify the chain of trust, and then, whoops. And then um, provide data to the to the router. So the router that also stands in the middle gets ROAS on one side, BGP announcements on the other, and then it can use ROAS to verify data in the BGP announcements to see if they match. And the the ultimate um, um, direction, the ultimate goal is to help a router make better routing decisions, which means having additional data on top of route objects and on top of uh, uh, the neighbors to figure out if a network is uh, supposed to be there or not. Well, you have different options for running validators. You have Routinator, Rust, uh, by NL NetLabs. You have RPK clients, that's part of the OpenBSD project written in C. You have Octo RPKI, that's from Cloudflare, and then Fort. Personally, I use Routinator and Fort. Um, that's a good mix. Um, I would suggest if you have OpenBSD or if you are uh, if you run Ubuntu, there's the there's the uh, portable version of RPKI client you can use there. You can try that as well. At the moment, the only one I wouldn't uh, use or trust 100% is Octo RPKI because um, the person who was maintaining that at, uh, at Cloudflare left, went to another, had an, uh, now has another job. So there is a maintenance issue there that I would consider. The rest, Routinator, RPKI client, Fort, I would recommend each and every one of them. So how do you configure and run a validator? That's actually very, very simple. Um, although the, the suggestion is to run at least two validators. In this case, we have Routinator and Fort. And you have to configure the correct uh, trust anchor locators. Um, they already, they've already been downloaded. The Arintal, I mentioned it, needs to be acknowledged separately. So the way it works is that when you try to, to run, say, Routinator, and it seems here I've skipped the passage. I'm, I'm already trying to run Routinator. How do you install that? It's actually very simple. There are packages for each and every platform you can imagine. So I, I didn't go into that detail here. But <clears throat> this is an example of how you could run Routinator from the command line. You say, run a server run RTR uh, on that IP address, on that port, and it tells you that you have to initialize it. And I think I remember, yeah. Well, his is uh, uh, the fourth initialization, so I, I confused it, but the concept is the same. You get, you were, you're told to download and read the RN Reliant Party Agreement from that URL. There's a PDF. It's, uh, it's a legal notice basically from Arin. And uh, once you've read it, you type yes, and then uh, Arin will, 
<laughs> and then Routinator or Fort will install the Trust Tanker locators where you tell it to do. And then the yeah, there's a passage that's uh, it's missing. So here, when you run uh, Routinator again uh, with the same command line, you get to um, to run to see it running, and then you should see it running here. The same goes with Fort. And um, yeah. Oh, okay. That's a good question. Sorry for the interruption. We have we set up Routinator and Fort. The number of prefixes from Fort is less than Routinators. Did you have the same experience? I guess the yes. Um, I think okay. This is this is interesting because it's a um, it's something I've been checking on and off. Um, because we run a tool called Roast at, uh, at um, Tysook. We, are, we do a daily run checking uh, the validity of prefixes. And of course, we have to rely on some validators. I've seen on and off issues with, uh, we have a bunch, sorry, take a step back. We have a bunch of uh, validators running, a mix like uh, of uh, Routinator and Fort. And I've had notifications that in some runs, um, some prefixes from some parts of the world didn't uh, show up as, uh, as valid, but they showed up as unknown, which, is a sim which might lead to, to what you are, uh, to similar experiences you are having. I haven't delved too much into this, but we can do it in a moment, once we set up the um, once we set up the, the 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 validators on the router, it is it might be given by how strict the validation is being done by the by Fort and the Routinator, or it might be given by one endpoint for the publication of the ROAs of the VRPs, sorry of the ROAs. Uh, is accessible from one install and maybe not reachable from the other. Uh, there might be different explanations. Um, I don't know the, I don't have a full answer for this, but I can tell you I have seen this and it's been on and off. And so it's been a bit hard to track, but uh, there are reports that the number of prefixes, uh, the number of ROAs is different between the two. There might be a play. There might be a reason for that. It might be that you've started uh, Routinator at one point, then half an hour later you started uh, Fort, and then there are changes in that half hour that uh, uh, Routinator hasn't picked up yet because it's waiting for the hour to pass as a uh, standard. Um, how do you call it? Refresh time. Or um, it might just be that there is something else going on in the validation. One of them does a stricter validation than others, so some objects don't pass the, the stricter validation. I don't have a full answer for this. I have pointers to what this, the issue could be. I'm sorry. Yeah, timing is also very relevant. Yeah. Yeah, so Tony is saying that uh, timing is also very relevant, and he even sees differences between two separate RPKI client installs. So there might be multiple uh, reasons for that, for what you see and what I have seen as well, and what Tony has, has seen. So <clears throat> as you can see, running a validator, you don't really have to change uh, much in the configuration. Uh, the only thing you might want to change, or well, the only thing you want to change in both Fort and Routinator is maybe the IP address they're going to bind on so that you can uh, then reach them from another host from, the, from your routers, but that's it. And then once they start running, you don't have to touch them. You, you might want to monitor them, but... Um, there's not much else to, to change in terms of configuration. At least in all the installs I've done, I've only touched the IP address they need to bind on for the RTR server, and that's it. 
haven't touched any timers or anything else. I guess uh, Turn might confirm he's done the same. Yes, he's nodding. Okay, thanks. So now we have a we have taken all this data, the data we have from the different RIRs. We have the validator. The validator verified the chain of trust for us. Now there's the final step. Final step is the validation. And in a moment, I'll also need to turn my light on because clouds have come here and it's too dark. But let's talk about the validation first. This is the part we've seen. We have the, uh, the repositories. We have rows and certificates with <coughs> either one of the two protocols, rsync or rrdp. You get the uh, you get the the data to the validator. Rsync is the usual rsync you've uh, most likely heard already about. Rrdp and I always keep calling rdap calling it rdap, but rdap is another protocol that's used for another thing. Rrdp based on HTTPS publishes. Every once in a while, the full repository and then deltas every once in a while. So to build the full repository as a validator, you get you you ask the HTTPS on in a file which one was the last full version that was uh, that was published. You download that, and then at the end, basically, you have a file that tells you what's the URL for the next uh, uh, well diff or uh, delta and then you walk the deltas all the way to the last one that was published so we get all these data to the validator the validator creates the validated cache by looking at the certificates by looking at the at the keys and then via rpki rtr this goes to the router and then the router defines what's valid and what's invalid. That's the ultimate goal of RPKR. So we verify the chain of trust. We've already showed it. And this works in a way where imagine if we have a row, this row here that says AS100 has this uh, 10.0.0.0 slash 22. And it should be, uh, this is what's, what you should see in the uh, routing table. So we have AS100 up there. And if we see an announcement that matches what we have in the row, perfect. If we have something slightly different, so in this case, AS100 creates a, a BGP announcement for a slash 24 that is more specific than, than that slash 22. We've already seen it when we were looking at the, at the rows. Unfortunately, we cannot accept, we should not accept that, uh, that prefix. And the same happens when AS200 tries to announce something. The AS doesn't, doesn't match the one that's in the row. So that BGP announcement also should show up as invalid. So how does this whole system work? Remember, we have two stages. One is row validation, one is BGP origin validation. In the raw validation, we just look at the chain of trust, and then we have valid rows and invalid rows. The valid rows get published into the validated cache, so they get to the routers. The invalid rows, they don't. So when we look at BGP origin validation, we only take the data from the rows that are valid from a raw validation point of view. With that in mind, we take the raw. We get the BGP announcement and we try to match the two. Do we, as we did in the previous slide, does the ASN match? Yes. Does the um, max length fit into the, well, does our prefix fit into the, the max length? Yes or no. Depending on the match, full match, where the prefix becomes valid or some mismatch, like a different ASN. Uh, a different prefix length that's not covered by the max length, then the BGP announcement becomes invalid. And those are the BGP announcements that you should be dropping. If, if there is no ROA, which means either the ROAs were invalid or they never got created, then the state becomes not found because we don't have a ROA 
we don't have data, we can match our BGP announcement with. This is the culprit of RPKI. So this scheme here is what you should just keep in mind when you look at RPKI, the three final states of a BGP announcement, valid, invalid, not found, or unknown in some cases. So, and how you get there? You get there by matching BGP announcements with what's in the ROAS. And the two things have to match. So far, so good. I, I can't see your faces. I can't see if you understood or if you have any doubts. So this is why I always think giving, uh, giving the same tutorial in person is much, much easier because you see everyone's faces. You understand if you need to repeat something or not. But this is all to say, if you have any question, there is the chat. You can open your microphone. Feel free to just jump in if anything is not clear here. Oh, I see. Oh, OK. There's a request to, uh, to share the slides. OK, not really a question, but yes, slides should be available then on the uh, on the website where you registered from. Um, I guess we, we can link them from the agenda. Yes. Uh, is there any other question? I don't see you any. So we can go ahead. Just be, there is a little bit more we can check here. Uh, <clears throat> Imagine you are in a situation where you have a customer that complains they can't reach a website. Ah, okay. Oh, um, a question about this. If you're still uh, um, going to cover this, okay. Can you advise on the actual router validation when using route reflectors? Okay, I think route reflectors could do the validation themselves and avoid propagating the, the prefix in that case, I have never set route reflectors up with uh, ROV. My network is very small, but I can't see any difference in how you would treat origin validation on route reflectors. Um, but anyway, I'll, we, we can get back to this. Um, okay. There's a nice question. Is there any research on whether step-by-step -step ROV causes additional delay in BGP propagation? I don't think there's a huge measurable effect. Um, there is, of course, because you're adding an additional check on top of the BGP update process. But it's we're talking about a, a lookup in, a, uh, in what is usually a very fast lookup uh, table. Um, Depending on the implementation, you know, you could have a tree or a, a radix tree with the with your prefixes with your rows. So the lookup should be very quick. In FRR, which is what we are, what I'm going to show during the demo, you see basically that um, rows represent an additional routing table with the addition of the max length. It's a special, uh, sort of slightly special routing table. But you see, they have their own table. Same uh, same happens with Bird, where you can check, uh, you can verify that entries are in the routing in in the uh, ROA routing table. So you basically are just adding another routing table where you do a lookup. So they introduce a delay. I'm not sure anyone has measured it, but it's in case someone does it, I think it would be a very small. Uh, delay that's introduced. So nothing would affect uh, your, uh, your process too much. Okay. Yes, that's actually a good point for uh, from Tim. says answering the question about route reflectors. If you do RO, uh, if you do, if you run route reflectors, you would still want to do ROV, so validation on the routers at the edge of your network. So the ones receiving the prefix. So you avoid having these invalid routes being installed on your on your router. So that makes sense. Um, and that's a good point I hadn't thought about when I was trying to answer the question. So thanks. 
Okay. Uh, yes. Um, I've done route servers, not route reflectors as well. And the general concept is the same as normal deployment. So thank you for validating that as well. So, uh, but route servers, if you mean at an internet exchange, they represent an edge of a network. It's just one point, but it's the edge of the, of the IXP and they talk to the edge of any uh, ISP peering at the IX. So in that case, it's slightly different from having route reflectors, which are something that's inside your network. And as Turn was saying, I would recommend not to, well, Turn was saying it, I would add my additional recommendation to not bring any invalid prefix inside your network. You can just leave them out from the edge. Uh, I see a hand up from Yasir. If you want to contribute something, feel free to open your microphone. Hey, Max, uh, it's Yasser. I would oh, Yasser, use, like, sorry. Yeah, sorry. No worries. So if you're running a two validator, that's suppose Fort and a routinator, and if you make a changes for any of the prefix, uh, let's suppose a scenario like if that row update is valid for one of the validator and it is invalid for the other validator, and when the BGP, when, when the routers basically sync with, with the validated cache, so what will happen in this, in this scenario? Because like we are getting two outputs, one is valid, one is invalid. Did you get the question? Yes, I get it. But I can't imagine how you would build something that is valid on one on one uh, validator and invalid on the other. Unless you have unless you have revoked the certificate in the meantime. And one has so <clears throat> so the question is basically about the synchronization because if if one validator takes maybe let's suppose two hours to sync with the uh, to sync with the database, and if other validator will take maybe more hours, like six or eight hours. So what will happen in this no, scenario? They don't, no, they don't have such a large um, difference. Such a large refresh time. The, the default. So um, um, I, I've seen. I'm not sure which one of the two. One of one of the two. Uh, has a fixed uh, refresh. So here comes the way the way RTR RPKI RTR works is that you have a you have the router connects and when it connects it gets the whole dump of the whole VRPs of the whole uh, validated cache. Then at the last um, let's call it last packet. It's the last uh, TLV it receives contains the indication of the refresh time. That basically is telling the, the router, come back to me after this timeout. And it's in seconds. And uh, I can't remember, I don't know which one of the two. So one, one between Fort and Routinator has a fixed one that's 3,600. The other one has a variable time that's in the hundreds of seconds. So it can be 10 minutes, so 600, it can be 700, it can be 200, and it changes. Um, this doesn't make any difference in the end because um, the, yes, the, the, the router will wait for, will, will set up a, like a spinning, wheel that says, wait for 3,600 seconds. But in the meantime, between the, in that hour, the RTR server could still send a packet, well, a notification to the, to the, to the router saying, hey, there is actually a new version of the cache because I've got, uh, I got news from, from my, the, the repositories and I have news for you. And so in that, in that uh, time frame, they can still get updated uh, data. So what, why did I say this? It's because you never know, there isn't really a, a, such a large time frame that's hours before the, the validators do another run. It's, uh, we're talking about, um, a few minutes normally. And then the, the validators keep checking for new data 
every five or 10 minutes from the different uh, sources. So you never have such a long uh, time between, between data refreshes. So uh, right. I, hope th I you. hope this indirectly answers your question. Yeah, all good, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I mean, you can manually set up the, um, the, the, the validators to do more, a quicker refresh, like get the, the, the data, update the data from the RIRs more often. And you could set it so that it has a manually set timeout for the routers, but I would not recommend that because they, they, they include still mechanisms to notify that there's a new, uh, that there's new data waiting for the router to, to pick it up. So there is no, no need to play with timers, no need to play with, uh, with anything. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, yes. In in the meantime, yes. So in a the 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 comment is anyway we have to accept the unknowns. So the ones where you don't have a route object. Yes. In a perfect world, the unknowns would be a very tiny percentage, because everyone would have created ROAs for the for covering their prefixes. But for now, uh, the unknowns represent such a large number that we still have to accept them. In the in the demo, in the demo, there I have actually a suggestion on how you could treat the unknowns. So so far, we have looked at the data we receive from the uh, RIRs. But imagine you have a situation where you have that slash twenty four that is a network where there are some services that are being provided by AS100. And you have another AS somewhere else on the internet. And some customers complain they can't access that, that slash 24, because, well, you can see it. Someone made a mistake in creating the uh, ROA. And there is no, no specific ROA for that slash 24. So that prefix for you is inbound. But you know that it's legitimate. You know that actually there are services that your users need on that slash 24. So what can you do? There is a system called Slurm that helps you in being able to create uh, what's called an allow list, or yes, it used to be called a whitelist. You uh, are telling the validator to create a fake ROA inside their validated cache with specific details. This, uh, this fake ROA gets sent to the router. The router then picks up a new ROA for that prefix and that prefix magically becomes valid just for you, just for your network, not for the other networks. It's something you create internally just for yourself. Well, for the the routers that rely on that specific validator. Now, my suggestion if you use this, if you use this mechanism, is to set a reminder in your calendar in a few days to remove this, see the effect, or see if someone has fixed the issue with the original network, and then hopefully delete it. Because if you leave it there, if you forget that you created an exception in your validator, then in the long run, the, the number of exceptions keeps growing, 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 and then you end up with a fake small routing table inside your, uh, inside your uh, routers. So uh, suggestion is you create that, make an exception, but then put it in your calendar to recheck that exception in a few days because then you can clear it if it has been corrected, or you can send a reminder email to the network operator on the other side to say, hey, fix this issue because otherwise my users will not be happy. So here's how we set up origin validation, uh, an example. We go with ConfT, router, uh, router BGP with the AS number, and then the first thing we need to do is to set up the address for the 
uh, validators. So we need to tell our uh, router, pick the information <coughs> from that uh, series of validators. And the suggestion is always to have at least two on different hosts. Don't do like I did in this example, where they're both on the same host with uh, operating on different ports. And then the suggestion is to create a root map, a root map with uh, entries that match RPKI, valid, the valid state, and not found. And then here's an example. It's a very stupid thing you can do, but it can help you. You can set the local preference for the RPKI valid to 100, keep it default, but then for the not found, lower it to 80. It's not going to change much in your routing, but at least you have a sort of a tag you can check to see was this uh, an, an additional tag. You can check quickly to see if the prefix was uh, valid or invalid. Uh, well, sorry, or not found. Although you can see it also when you when you run a series of commands. Then you apply the root map accepting, well, RPK accept in, so on the in, inbound, and then you should see uh, the prefixes that are not, sorry, let me go back, because we, we don't have a specific statement matching RPKI invalid, the invalid prefixes will just be discarded. This is the same configuration, but for Juniper, um, you set up a group for RPKI validators, you set up a session to a certain IP address, a certain port, uh, which one is your local address. And then you do the um, policy policy statement for, again, valid. And in the next one for, uh, well, invalid in this case, we also have that. And then last for unknown, as Juniper calls it unknown in the validation state. And then you can see here we have the accept, we have the accept for invalids as well. This is uh, an example of bad practice, but this is so you can get an idea of how you should not be doing that. And once we have this, we are basically also, uh, see, this is another thing that's also mentioned later. You can add communities to, to say to your prefixes when you accept them and, um, Ah, so getting back to the validator configuration is uh, not sure if your Cisco config actually worked. I can tell you it worked because that's taken from the labs we used to run. Um, on Juniper, you couldn't get two validators on different ports on the same host to be accepted. Well, that's good point. Th those are good points for, uh, for Juniper. Don't run two validators on the same host. Run them on two different hosts. So I guess that's a trick to, to trick you into not running two validators on the same host. And then turn says, don't add communities. Why not? Can you explain that? I can, I, I can try to do it by uh, talking. Yes, uh, the bad thing with communities is if your uh, 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 validator crashes, for example, and um, all routes um, change because they change from eventually, not immediately because you still have your cache on your router. Uh, your routes change from um, uh, valid to uh, unknown. And that would create an update message for every route in your routing table to, well, your whole IGP probably. So you would create a lot of unneeded uh, uh, routes uh, updates that way. It's uh, considered not to be the best idea. Okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> no, that, that's one of the, well, actions that I've uh, also mentioned at the end of the demo. Okay. That's something you could, you could also do. But yeah, no it's, problem. It's a no good, problem. it's a good way to to, to do a quick verification uh, on, uh, especially on not uh, 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 validating routers. But there are risks involved, so you should really consider if you, is that's what you want. And 
I used to do it uh, too, and we stopped doing it uh, for especially this reason. Okay, that makes sense. So now I have a demo for you. Let me get my uh, terminal and start sharing that. Actually, I will also go through the through the slides quickly and then I'll go back to them. So, uh, oh wait. <clears throat> Let me stop sharing and sharing still the slides. I got a bit confused. So what we have is a situation where we have the, oh, I had corrected this, but I didn't say it. So remember that we created, we have a, a ROA for AS58280 originating this slash 22. That's the ROA we've seen <coughs> in my LAR portal. Then there is, uh, we will see that in the labs, we have an announcement for a slash 24 and some other networks that are invalid. We are going to set up validators and then with AS101, we will receive, we are receiving some network announcements from AS58280. Some of them are too specific and we will filter them out. So if I go into the lab, and here we are. This is a FRR running on uh, on um, some uh, miners hardware we have. This is a virtual FRR. I have a transit. And as you can see, we have 45.129.224.0 slash 22. We have a more specific slash 24 that should be invalid. Then we have some other BGP announcements that are also similar. So this one, we should not be seeing it in our um, in our lab, in our routing table. But we have to do something first. First of all, on terminal, and then we we define RPKI, and then in here we do RPKI cache. So we say we tell our FRR this is our validated cache. At this address, 1.3, 1.62, uh, 143, 143.28, port is 3323, and we have to define a preference. So we're telling this is our preferred source. Use this one. And let's put another one, 1.3, 1.62, oops, 143. And 29 on port 8323. Preference, we set it to two. Okay, so I finished. And I could do the show RPKI prefix table. Woo, these are all the rows I have in here. These are all the rows that have been. Uh, well, the VRPs that have been downloaded from from my my router, from my sorry validated cache, and with this I am I have them in my routing table. I have them here. So if I do show IP BGP, you see what I have here. This is an additional piece of information that wasn't there earlier. So I have RPKI validation codes. So my router, as soon as I provided a data source, basically, my uh, pointers to my, um, to my validators, it started doing uh, validation in RPKI. So I see that this prefix is valid. This one is, and this one is invalid. Another one that's valid, and the others are all invalid. So this tells me that the moment I start creating my, my uh, root map, let's go ahead and copy. I can do route map and I call it RPKI in SC permit 20. So I do match uh, RPKI not found. Voila. And let's do a set local preference 100 in this case. <laughs> let's not do 80 because then we do map, RPKI in permit 
30. Then I do match RPKI valid. Then I can go set local preference 120. Let's raise the local preference for the valid routes. So, show run. If I show you what I have, I have this route map similar to the one we saw earlier. I match not found and I give it a local preference of 100. I match valid and I give it a local preference of 120. I don't match invalids because I don't want to accept them. So they will be just be discarded. So far, so good. Okay, so the next step, router BGP, see I have 101 is my ASN, 100 and, oh, router BGP, 101. Then I need to go into the address family IPv4 unicast. Well, and then I do neighbor, and my neighbor is this, 110.1.0.2, remote, a, uh, sorry, remote, uh, root map, RPKI in, in. Voila. Let's clear the BGP session. Let's do it brutally. But now if I wait for a moment and do show IP BGP, I only have the valid networks in there. The slash 22 and the slash 24 for which I have the um, rows. And then I have local preference became 120. And above it was just, oh, not specified. So it was 100, the default value. So far, so good. Do we have any question? Let me check the chat. I see the chat is blinking at me. Oh, Mark, uh, configs for Microtik version seven. Um, I have actually a very old um, blog post that I did about uh, 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 RootOS version seven and RPKI. I should actually refresh that. But um, the concept is the same. I can, I can go and refresh them. I just don't have a, a virtual machine with, uh, with um, uh, RooterOS running right now. But this is the concept with, um, on how to run it with, uh, with um, FRR. Let me stop sharing my screen and share the slides. Because uh, I've gone through this demo setup. <coughs> uh, I've configured the validators. I was following this basically. Um, show the RPKI prefix table, check the, that if it worked, check if adding the validators brought in the additional data. And then we create a root map. And last but not least, we applied the uh, root map to the neighbor. And then this slash 24 should have disappeared from our table, which was the case. So um, yes, this goes against what uh, Turn just said. Uh. <laughs> I see the nice uh, discussion there. Um, I know Mark. Um, we can provide more more um, checks with uh, with Microtik. Maybe let me let me see this. If you if you promise you'll be at the next uh, at the next uh, tutorial on Wednesday, I will add Microtik. So you'll have to be there and bring more people from South Africa from the from the um, the South African NOG. I'll see if I can add the the Microtik parts. I'll let the I'll let you know on the on the channel there on the Telegram channel and Zanog discuss. <clears throat> so what uh, this goes against what Turn just said, don't bring around uh, stuff with, the, with, uh, with communities. But my initial intention was to show if which one is valid and which one is not found. 
not uh, bringing around the invalids with uh, with a, a community tagged with them. Let's see, I see you're typing. Is there any other wisdom you want to share? Yeah, for testing, this is fine. Yes, uh, maybe it's not better. It's better not to do it on a large uh, uh, production network. But yes, you could do this. You could, well, I mean, yeah, if you run your own network, you could tag your routes the way you want. Um, maybe you want to figure out where they come from, how they were validated. There's a different way of doing that. But um, you can uh, you can treat them the way you want. Now you can go to a website. There's a uh, if you go with your browser to this URL, you can check if your network if the network you're on applies origin validation. Now, a question for you. How do you think this works? Because I always like to test if people were following. See you, Yasser. OK. Would anyone like to try to explain how this uh, system works? It's relatively simple once you figured out the we have any volunteer. You can open your microphone and just try to to see if you if you can think of a of a re, of a way for. A... Yes, good point. So, the there is a not the web server. That's a good point, Bill. Um, Okay, now it's broken. Uh, okay, okay. Um, anyway, the way it works is, the way it worked or will work is you get your browser to, we get, so you open, you open this page with your browser. The, the page tries to open two different files that are hosted on two different networks. One network validates, the other one doesn't. So if your browser can fetch both files, then there is no origin validation happening on your network. If only one file can be fetched and the other can't, then it means origin validation is being applied. It's a, it's a relatively easy test to, to implement. You can do it in JavaScript. You can do it in any any language. Well, language that runs on the um, on the user's uh, browser. Now this is broken. I'll report it to Natalie, and uh, and hopefully we'll get this fixed. Now wrapping up. Uh, I know we still would have an hour, but we went relatively quick. So some quick suggestions, uh, run multiple validators, both in type and location. Don't underestimate the location. So the way <clears throat> I've set up my network is that, well, I run software routers. So I run BERT and I run it on FreeBSD, which means I have access to a system, a virtualization, sort of a virtualization system called Jails. So for every router I put, I run BERT on the uh, op operating system, on the base, base operating system. And then I run two jails with one validator each. So I have two different jails, two different validators per pop, basically. And then I, I point my BERT to different other validators and maybe other pops. Monitor them monitor these validators because I've seen cases where the serial number was not increasing and which means that the validation is stuck and you're using stale data. Uh, monitor that the RTR port is, or is up, is answering. <clears throat> and then I mentioned it earlier, when you want to figure out what's happening with your network, you can use BGP Alerter, which is not directly, strictly related to RPKI, but it helps you uh, have an eye on what's happening to your prefix, <coughs> your prefixes um, in a very easy way. 
It's written in uh, JavaScript, uses Node, but you can just download it. You can download a, um, a release. Uh, there's the version for Mac OS, there's a version for Unix, for Linux, and you can just run it from the command line. When you run it the first time, it helps you with questions in creating the config file. What's your ASN? What are the prefixes you want to monitor? Anything else? And then you can set it up to notify you on uh, Slack, Telegram, WhatsApp, anything. I know WhatsApp, I'm not sure, but uh, Slack, IRC, Telegram, these are all uh, doable. Email, IRC, and then get, get a notification when something happens, something changes in the routing of your prefixes. How does it do that? It does it by looking at RIS data. RIS is the routing information system from RIPNCC, a series of root collectors spread all over the world uh, that feed data to what's called RIS Live. Basically, you are listening on RIS Live via JSON. You're listening on network events, BGP updates happening. I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next few days. And looking at RIS data, your BGP alerter is able to figure out if there has been any change in routing to your prefixes and then notify you if there's anything that's uh, suspicious. And on top of that, BGP Alerter was written by Massimo, which is a fellow Italian, so you should be using it just because of this. But we also have Manners training tutorials, uh, manners.org slash tutorials. Um, they're uh, a bit larger for, they're not just about RPKI, they are about uh, Manners in, uh, in total, in uh, everything about Manners, how to implement it. And we have a hands-on lab that's being refreshed as we speak with more uh, uh, platforms or things, but you can use this as a standalone lab or for the final exam. And then if you are willing to have a look at uh, manners and how you can join that. And then you can get involved in the community. So maybe amongst you, amongst the 40 people that are still connected, there's someone who might speak at the next, uh, at next year's RPKI week. Do we have any remaining questions? I don't see the chat blinking, so I don't see any questions there. And I see we've lost people. We were at about 50 people on the, on the tutorial, but now we are at 37. We've reached the end, so that means you'll have 50 minutes back that you can use to maybe test some more features of RPKI or to look into setting up um, a lab or anything, or is there anything else you'd like to, to know? Do you have any remaining question? Otherwise, I will be waiting here for five, 10 minutes and uh, feel free to open your mic and just ask the questions. And with this, I would thank you all for being here. Having almost 40 people all the way to the end um, means a lot to me. So thank you for being here and I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, sorry about the noise outside, but you know, when you decide to, okay, let's keep the window open, kids decide to play. Then I figured out, luckily when Tun was talking that I live next to, to an airport and it was the first day they reintroduced the A380 here in Zurich from, uh, from uh, um, uh, what's the company, Emirates. So I actually witnessed again the A380 departing from here. So uh, thank you very much for being here. I see, I see a lot of thank yous, but I, I have to thank you. And if you have any question, my email address Recording is there. You had, the, you had the one from Turn, and thank you very much. And thank you, Turn, for being here. You're welcome.